Good afternoon. My name is Jeannie Birch. I am the co-director of the Penn Institute for Urban Research. And here with me is Michael Replogel from the, the founder of the Institute for Transportation Development and Policy and currently head of their Global Policy Initiative, formerly with the Environmental Defense Fund, where he was head of their transportation, director of transportation uh, for EDF. Joining us is Stuart Andreasen, who is a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania and intimately interested in the topics that uh, Michael will talk to us about today. So Michael, uh, tell us how and when you decided to start the Institute. Well, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy really started back in 1984 uh, when the United States had blown up the oil storage facilities in Corinto, Nicaragua uh, as part of the U.S. war on Central America. And uh, there was a whole transportation crisis going on in that country and efforts in health and education were suffering for lack of transportation and so I actually worked with a number of bicycle activists in different cities and some bike mechanics who had gone to Nicaragua and uh, had some ties there and we recycled some secondhand bicycles to health and education efforts in Nicaragua taking bikes from people's getting secondhand bikes donated from people's garages and basements and sending them through church groups, um, actually with help of the U.S. Agency for International Development Ocean Freight Reimbursement Program, which paid to ship the bikes as humanitarian aid to Nicaragua on a program called Bikes Not Bombs. And we began that in the summer of 1984, and then we initially started with 100 bikes, and then after, by the end of 84, we sent 100 bikes, and there was clearly a big demand for more. And so we said, why not send a thousand? And uh, in fact, by the end of 1985, we'd sent a thousand bikes. And in the middle of 1985, we incorporated uh, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy as a nonprofit group to serve as an umbrella for the Bikes Not Bombs initiative and for other initiatives looking to help develop uh, transport that serve the needs of low-income people in Haiti and Mozambique and that also would work to help reform transportation policies at the World Bank and other multilateral development banks. At the time, those banks were very focused on building more roads and some investment in railways, but very little investment, uh, in fact, often completely ignoring bicycles and walking as fundamental means of transport in developing countries. So we helped to turn that around in the several years to follow. And today the institute has now grown to uh, be an institution with about 85 staff members and a budget of about $10 million a year. And we're working in a couple of dozen countries, uh, a couple dozen cities around the world in about 10 countries. And you haven't lost your focus on bicycles, but you have broaden the focus, haven't you, uh, in the work that you're doing? We have. In, in the 1990s, uh, we uh, began to look at some of the successful models in other countries and looked at places like Curitiba, Brazil, which had developed a bus rapid transit system under the leadership of Mayor Jaime Lerner, and uh, started calling attention to those models of successful, low-cost public transport development. And these got picked up on by uh, Enrique Peñalosa, who uh, became mayor of Bogota in 1999 and led to a real transformation of that city as he built the Transmillennia bus rapid transit system, which has become a world model for many other cities. Uh, Enrique Peñalosa, after he stepped down as mayor, joined our board of directors and uh, is now president of the organization. Uh, we, at the same time, have learned from those examples and about six or seven years ago decided that uh, a fundamental goal for us should be to create world-class bus rapid transit systems on all of the continents on which we work as local models for sustainable transport development and to use those bus rapid transit systems to help also introduce better walking and cycling and traffic management all things that could be done within one term of office of a mayor. And so we've developed this into quite a successful business model, working with a lot of foundation funding, with some funding from the UN uh, 
and the global environmental facilities. Uh, sometimes some funding from the U.S. Agency for International Development and donor funds. And we basically uh, develop memorandum of understanding with mayors and uh, city and state officials and use those to help provide technical resources at a world-class level to help mayors and governors and heads of state implement sustainable transportation quickly and to become new models within their region and sphere of influence. We're now trying to take these best practice examples to scale in China, India, Latin America, and other countries of the world um, because we really faced with the problem of how do we create sustainable transportation in the world's thousands of cities as we're undergoing a fundamental move towards global urbanization. Uh, we now have seven billion people on the planet. Half of those people live in cities. Um, within the developing world, more than half of people will live in cities by 2030. We have hundreds of millions of people moving into cities in places like China and India over the next 10 to 20 years. And if the pattern of urbanization in those cities follows the high carbon growth path that we see in places like the United States, it will be a disaster, not only for those countries and their dependence on imported oil and their pollution and their traffic fatalities and the horrible traffic congestion, but it will also be disaster for our planet in terms of the implications for climate change. And so we're working uh, in close partnership with one of our major supporters, the Climate Foundation, and a number of other foundations to help uh, these cities develop patterns of urbanization that follow a low carbon growth path, that learn from the best practices in places like Stockholm and Bogota, and, and now create new positive examples in places like Guangzhou, China, and Ahmedabad, India, uh, where they can become examples uh, for city officials throughout their region of development. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about um, kind of the lessons that you've learned on bus rapid transit and the um, and, and now the rating system that, that you've developed? Well, across the world, uh, we have seen some very successful models of bus rapid transit uh, that can move 25 to as many as 45,000 passengers per hour per direction uh, on a single corridor running buses as if they were a surface metro with high degrees of priority in the traffic, with reserved bus lanes, with uh, special treatment at the intersections to reduce delay, with special stops that, and stations that enable people to get on and off the buses extremely fast through multiple wide doors with at-grade boarding, with integrated fare systems, with integrated passenger information systems, uh, all of which are designed to transform the experience of using buses into one that's akin to using the world's best rail systems, uh, delivering high speeds, high reliability and good performance and high efficiency. These systems can be created in the span of as little as two years or, or even less. They can be created at a cost of sometimes on the order of ten million dollars US per kilometer uh, and implemented faster and cheaper than building equivalent capacity metro systems, for example. And metros deliver wonderful transportation services to cities, uh, and they serve as a, an essential core for urban development in many cities. And uh, we think that where they exist, we should be integrating those with things like bus rapid transit. But at the same time, it can often take as long as a decade or more to build a metro, and it can often cost 10 times or more than it does to build a bus rapid transit system to create a metro. So these are trade-offs that have to be looked at in terms of how effectively can you provide a wide area of coverage 
for high quality public transport in a very large metropolitan area where fiscal capacity to build transportation is often limited. So if the choice is between building 10 kilometers of metro or 100 kilometers of bus rapid transit, we see a clear advantage in making the tough political choice of reallocating some of the street space at the surface away from car traffic and favoring public transport to save the public money and to also deliver a higher quality, better travel choice to people who travel. But there are also a lot of systems around the world, places where uh, public transport operators have said, yes, we want to create uh, better bus services, and they've uh, slapped the bus rapid transit label onto essentially glorified express bus services or conventional bus services with poorly enforced bus lanes with no special vehicles, no special fare systems, and uh, the result has been to degrade the brand and the value of bus rapid transit. And so some people in some places, uh, like Boston, for example, have recently had communities reject uh, the notion of creating bus rapid transit in their neighborhood because there was a perception that, that this was an inferior second-class service. And neighborhoods would say, no, we want rail service because that's better. Um, so there is a question here of how do you ensure the integrity of the product uh, and how do you recognize high quality systems that deliver this superior service. So the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy uh, recently created a, a BRT scorecard uh, and a rating standard working with global experts uh, and this enables one to score systems in cities around the world to see how well they rate and whether they come up as gold standard, silver standard, or bronze standard uh, bus rapid transit. And then there are, of course, systems that fall short of those high quality standards. And one may call some of them BRT, but they certainly don't reach the standard of gold, silver, or bronze. So in the United States, for example, we see only uh, three systems that make the level of bronze uh, operating in Los Angeles, Eugene, Oregon, and, uh, and in uh, Cleveland. Uh, all small systems and fairly isolated corridors. And ITDP is now working with uh, officials in Chicago and Montgomery County and Oakland uh, and exploring other cities where we might help create gold standard bus rapid transit in the United States. And we're working to use these standards to upgrade services around the world. Tell us about the potential for the APEC economies. Um, I know you've got projects in China. Yes. And are you working on other ones elsewhere? We are. Um, ITDP has helped to uh, design and develop the BRT, gold standard BRT systems in Ahmedabad and Guangzhou, China. We're also working on the system in Lanzhou, China, which will open uh, next year. Um, we're working also on si systems in uh, four or five other cities in India. And in uh, work, we've worked recently on systems in Cape Town and Johannesburg, uh, also in Jakarta. Uh, which has created a fairly large network which uh, has some operating challenges that need to be overcome and we're working with the city to help them overcome those challenges to improve the efficiency and design of stations and things like that. Now tell us a little more about Jakarta because that is a rapidly growing place in terms of vehicles mm -hmm. and you're trying to counter that so uh, tell us what the opportunities and the challenges are. Well Jakarta is one of the uh, most challenging megacities in the world for traffic management and uh, it, you know, in the entire metropolitan area we have about 11, 10 million people in the core and about 25 million in the larger metropolitan area. Uh, the number of new motor vehicles being registered in that area is going up by uh, more, well more than a thousand a day. Uh, and Strategies that were put in place even just a few years ago, uh, like the three-in-one uh, corridor uh, that operates on a, on a major north-south artery and, uh, and a spur that, that runs to the west, 
and requires drivers to have three passengers in the vehicle to use the facility there during rush hours. Those, even those systems are, are really breaking down uh, due to the severe traffic pressures. Um, for example, there young people often will offer their services for 50 cents or a dollar to fill the empty seats in cars at the southern end in the morning uh, of the corridor so that the drivers can ride in the three-in-one corridor. And, and then the, the, uh, the jockeys, as they call them, will take a, a bus back to the south and repeat this a uh, couple of times during rush hour and make a little money. It's always away, money. isn't there? <laughs> and so, but this points to some of the limitations of, a, of a, these kinds of regulatory street management policies. And so we've been working with officials in the city of Jakarta to explore things like uh, improved bus rapid transit, which they have put into this corridor and into actually uh, uh, 10 or more corridors now across Jakarta, and to also look at things like congestion charging, uh, which I think has some promise in the longer term for Jakarta if the city can get the proper, proper implementation authority from the national government to uh, administer and enforce those systems. Jakarta has a series of, of bus, reserve bus lanes on major arterial streets, and these were put in um, by the previous administration and some by the current uh, administration of the city to make sure that the buses aren't stuck in the same traffic as uh, general uh, drivers. And there are special stations. Um, and at level boarding in the stations. There's a pre-boarding fare, pre fare collection, which speeds up the boarding process. But there are some uh, operational challenges, as I mentioned. Some of the stations that were designed by the city uh, were not made large enough. They're a little too narrow. And, so, and, and there are also some challenges in how the buses are being operated which in some cases require excessive transfers in the system, which increases the need to be able to manage people through the system, and the stations get overcrowded, and then that makes it hard for people to get on and off the buses, which slows the whole system down. Uh, a couple of years ago, there were problems with the bus lanes being enforced by the traffic police. Those seem to be mostly worked through now. Um, there have also been a series of problems with uh, supply reliability for compressed natural gas and, mm -hmm. and uh, large parts of the bus rapid transit system are, de are using uh, CNG buses and if you don't have uh, steady fuel supply and the buses have to spend a long time waiting to refuel, uh, that can be a problem and reduces the availability of the bus service so if the buses are overcrowded, there are not enough vehicles, then it causes, again, more delay in the system and erodes the, the, uh, the user experience and the attractiveness of using the BRT. So if these problems are worked through, if they can get a reliable compressed natural gas supply, get the station sizing more effectively done, uh, look at more effective interline routing through the system so that they can reduce the number of transfers and increase the number of one-seat rides that are offered in the system, and some other issues like this, improving some of the pedestrian connections into the stations, which right now are too narrow, which need to be enlarged to, again, reduce queuing and delays for people accessing and, and, and egressing the system. These are all things that can be fixed to turn it into more of a world-class system. It will become more attractive. And with that, it will, they'll have the foundation for giving people choices that are necessary to have in place to do an effective congestion charge system for the central area, which I think ultimately could do a lot more to help manage traffic in the Jakarta metro area. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the 1,000 vehicles per day. Um, you didn't mention, because it's probably not in your portfolio exactly, but I'm sure it's well in your thinking, there are, I don't know how many people forming an informal settlements per day. And so how do you keep up with the population growth that's occurring 
at the periphery or in interstitial spaces. How do you integrate mm -hmm. this, this BRT system into this kind of growth? Well, I think BRT actually offers uh, tremendous flexibility in terms of being able to be scalable, in terms of expanding the system and taking it out into the larger metropolitan area of Jabotebeck, and also looking at more effective feeder services from peripheral neighborhoods, uh, looking at ways of integrating things like uh, paratransit services mm -hmm. that can serve as feeders from informal settlements uh, into the main spines of an expanded bus rapid transit system. I know there are uh, discussions right now in Jakarta about this metropolitan expansion of the bus rapid transit system, and uh, I think those have some good promise. In dealing with low, uh, low, very low income informal settlements, it's very important to look at non-motorized transport access. And uh, for example, in Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, when Enrique Peñalosa was mayor, he spent, instead of putting money into paving uh, roads in low-income informal settlements around Bogota, he put money into creating high-quality paved walking and cycling tracks in low-income informal settlements, recognizing that most people living in these low-income informal settlements don't have cars, but they do walk and they do have bicycles, and that bicycles are a very affordable means of transport. And I think we can indeed judge you know, the quality of life in cities in many respects by how somebody on a $30 bicycle gets treated and make sure that the transport system gives equal honor to them as is given to someone driving a $30,000 car. So this um, um, program that we must have uh, for the future has to be fully integrated both with modes of transportation but also in the urban design aspects as well. You mentioned the stations. I'm sure you're thinking about land use and how, how extensions might be occurring That's around right. cities and how you could integrate these systems right from the get-go. Right. Um, have you done any of that work at, uh, at the Institute? Yes. Um, ITDP is getting increasingly involved in urban design and urban planning initiatives and uh, doing this particularly in, in China and India um, where we're, and, and some in Latin America where we're working with uh, sort of leading architects and urban designers to think about uh, how to modify street design standards and urban design standards for whole new districts uh, of cities as they're being extended and expanded and to look at the replanning of areas around major uh, public transport terminals um, so that those have higher density mixed use development that's very walkable and bikeable uh, and that supports this kind of integrated uh, transport land use planning. Uh, we've recently launched an initiative called Our Cities Ourselves, which has brought together, we've commissioned uh, 10 architects uh, working in 10 different cities around the world to look at specific neighborhoods in these cities and to envision how different sustainable transport principles could help to transform these areas to make them more sustainable, low carbon communities. And this has started some very exciting conversations between architects and real estate developers and transportation professionals and policymakers in these cities and beyond, which we think will bear a lot of fruit for the future. I know you have some beautiful slides of the project so far. We will link those slides to Great. this interview because not only are you making these areas sustainable and efficient and functional, you're also making them beautiful. Yes. And in so many places, beauty has not occurred uh, just because of the quick, rapid urbanization that's occurring. And I think that's a feature as well that um, people don't necessarily think of when they think when they're doing transportation. But I think the uh, contribution you're making in this arena is really, really uh, very, very important. Thank you. Well, we're working with a you know, very exciting team of people who I think bring a lot of vision to this, and that vision catches fire in multiple circles around the world, uh, locally and globally. Um, Enrique Peñalosa, the former mayor of Bogota, who's ITDP's president, has often said that 
the challenge ahead of us is is not so not necessarily so much to create affluent cities as to create happy cities mm -hmm. and that you know he looked at his own city you know many years back and said you know at the rate of even at a rapid rate of increasing economic growth it would take a hundred years for Bogota to catch up with America but that a place where uh, a city like Bogota could catch up uh, and in fact surpass America quickly is in livability and happiness and so he sought as mayor to focus on what things could he do in the three years of office he had to transform the city and so he focused on recapturing the sidewalks for pedestrians, creating green ways throughout the city, allocating uh, more priority for public transport, creating a network of libraries, creating more effective public education systems, providing basic sanitary water and sewer services to marginalized uh, informal settlements, and connecting those informal settlements to the city network with good, high-quality, non-motorized transport options. And, and with that, uh, did a lot to transform the civic culture of the city. So I think that's a model that many other mayors across the world are looking at with some admiration and beginning to copy. And that is the true definition of sustainable development, yeah. encompassing the economic, the social, and the environmental. That's so right. that's very, very exciting. Do you have another question, uh, Stuart? No, this has been all very interesting. Uh, jobs, maybe? Are you interested in jobs? Absolutely. Um, what, <laughs> we'll edit this. <laughs> what are what are the um, what are the opportunities for um, for job creation around um, the intermodal uh, um, transportation systems that you've talked about, both in the developing and developed world? Yeah. Well, I think. You know, if you look at the studies, the system that we've developed of car-dependent uh, transport systems in, in the United States are actually rather unproductive in terms of job creation. If you think about it in very practical terms, uh, I think it's, it's illustrative. The, illustrative the, in, for example, in the United States, uh, for every dollar that one spends as a motorist on gasoline to refuel your car, something like 85 cents of that dollar leaves the local economy, much of it going outside the country to pay for the imported oil. But if you spend that same dollar on a public transport fare, riding the bus or a subway to get to work, 85 cents of that dollar stays in the local economy because it goes to labor. Um, a large part of it goes to paying for the, the labor of the public transport drivers and the mechanics who fix the buses and things like that. And that in turn stimulates uh, ongoing economic activity with multiplier effects of several dollars uh, for every dollar spent. So, the implications are significant. There was a, a recent study done by Smart Growth America that uh, suggested uh, just in very short-term stimulus spending that for every million dollars spent on public transport, uh, there would be something like 17 percent more jobs generated for public sector, public transport investment compared to investment in roads. And there's a recent study done by the UN Environment Program uh, looking at uh, the green economy that suggested that shifting uh, about one-third of a percent of the world's gross domestic product into supporting uh, sustainable public transport and increased vehicle efficiency in coming years could help us to significantly reduce, reduce the amount of traffic that it takes to support an equivalent amount of economic development by about a third, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by an equivalent amount, and at the same time spurring about 10 percent more jobs to be created in the transport sector. Um, so investments in the sustainable economy can create a lot more jobs and also help reduce our dependence on oil that's increasingly costly 
and that can free up additional investments that go into things like education and health care and housing. And, and to follow up on that, how does that um, also help support the economy as far as moving, uh, moving goods through freight systems? Yeah. Um, another very important area to look. The, in the world's transportation systems today, uh, logistics efficiency is a, a key concern. We have an increasingly globalized economy, and yet if one looks at the supply chain efficiency, one finds a lot of places where trucks are only very partially loaded and running around empty, where trucks are being used for transport for many goods movements for which rail could move the same goods at a lower cost, both in dollars and in uh, environmental damage. And there are a lot of opportunities for getting more productivity out of our economic assets by using information and communications systems and better performance-focused operational systems in transport to help companies cut the amount that they have to spend on transport while also reducing their footprint on the environment. And so all of these things are ways of substituting uh, so sort of the old dumb systems of the 20th century, replacing those with smarter systems for the 21st century that enable us to create a new green economy. The work you're doing fits so closely with the Energy Smart Community Initiative, particularly the Low Carbon Model Towns Project that APEC is supporting. So I hope in the future we can have more conversations such as this. It's really very valuable. I know that our uh, viewers are going to be very excited to um, hear this interview, and I'm wondering if we can put your connections, your address and so forth on the website for sure. people to contact you. I'd welcome that. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.